directors for uh, the invitation. It's uh, both an honor and pleasure to be here. Um, we heard a bit earlier in the week uh, how helium films were probably the best test of the validity of VKT theory. Um, so the spirit of, uh, of our work is in the same vein, really, to use uh, helium, particularly uh, confined helium and helium in two dimensions as model systems. I guess the cold atomic gases people would call it a quantum simulator to try to um, have clean materials to uh, test ideas about exotic quantum uh, ground states. And I hope to convince you in this talk that the variety of cases that we can look at is quite broad. And there are two distinct approaches, uh, top-down and bottom-up, so I'll explain what that means. Uh, in the top-down, we're going to be talking about um, topological superfluidity. Um, so in the uh, classification of topological quantum matter, topological superconductors are an important class of material. Um, with emergent uh, surface and edge excitations. Uh, the field is actually wide open because there aren't really any confirmed bulk topological superconductors. Um, whereas it's well established that superfluid helium-3 uh, is topological. And in point of fact, uh, the work on this by Principally, Grisha Volovic was pretty prescient and uh, starting in the, in the late uh, 80s, I believe, uh, was talking about the topological classification of these materials, um, surface, edge excitations, and so on. So this is probably a decade or more before uh, topological insulators came up. And as we heard in the discussion early in the, in the week, topological insulators, it's about band structure, whereas here, it's an, uh, in the case of topological superconductivity, you have an emergent phase, and so strong correlations are, uh, are, 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 the, are the key. Um, so um, uh, these are the people that are involved uh, in, the, in the work. Um, I'd particularly like to draw attention to uh, Lev Levitin, who's uh, a brilliant young guy who's been working on the confined superfluid helium-3. Uh, Frank Arnold has also made strong contributions. He's now working in the Max Planck Institute in Dresden. And we have interesting theoretical interactions with Piers Coleman, Andrew Ho, who some of you know, um, and uh, theoretically with James Sauls, and a bit with Grisha Volovic. And Anton Vorontsov is now on sabbatical in our lab. <coughs> um, so the ability to produce temperatures in the microkelvin uh, re regime in Europe uh, resides in about half a dozen labs. Together, we form the European microkelvin platform. So that's an interchange of expertise and other stuff. <coughs> um, a lot of what we've been able to do uh, has relied on the development of um, new techniques, um, squid NMR in particular. And there, uh, we've been fortunate to collaborate with the best people in the world for producing low noise DC squids at PTB in, in, in Berlin. <coughs> we've also have a very fruitful uh, partnership with GVEC Papia at Cornell, where they have the Cornell nanofabrication facility. <coughs> So uh, the bottom-up approach, then, <coughs> is to grow a thin film on a surface. And the surface that we use is graphite. Uh, graphite's atomically flat, in contrast with the mylar substrate that uh, was discussed earlier this week, John Reppy and Bishop's work. <coughs> so the helium films that grow on graphite are atomically layered. Here's the absorption potential of a single helium-3 atom on the surface of graphite. You see the ground state here. Uh, this is uh, um, potential as a function of position from the surface. So the ground state is bound uh, with an energy of 150 Kelvin. 
Um, so it's a strictly two-dimensional system. Um, helium-4, because of its higher mass, is more strongly bound. And the difference in the binding of different gases that you put on the graphite surface we will use to good effect in the following way. So here's a picture of the graphite surface, uh, and here are two layers. Um, there's a distinct layering transition. So you add helium atoms to the surface, you form the first layer, and then at some uh, total coverage, atoms get promoted into the, into the second layer. And these different layers have different characters. So the first uh, helium layer, um, when it's completed, forms a compressed, incommensurate triangular lattice. And then the next bunch of atoms in the second layer, they move around on top. And at low densities, they form a fluid phase. And at high densities, they form a solid phase. And that's really interesting. Um, so uh, because of this um, preferential binding of uh, helium-4 that I just discussed, you can do a trick. So rather than having two layers of helium-3, you could replace this layer with helium-4. And then that's non-magnetic, and it's essentially inert in, in this case, and grow the helium-3 on top. That's technically um, an important thing to do. Um, that's an example of pre-plating the surface. And you can do that then in a bunch of different ways. You can have uh, one layer of helium-4, two layers of helium-4, uh, a solid bilayer of helium-4, and then one or two layers of superfluid helium-4. Or you could go back and say, well, I won't use helium-4, I'll use hydrogen. <coughs> so every time you've taken the graphite surface and you've pre-plated it in th this way, that's now your new composite substrate. And then the physics you're going to do is by adding helium-3, let's say, uh, to that composite substrate. <coughs> and each composite substrate um, can be used to model uh, different, different physics. And this is the shopping list of the stuff uh, that we've done. So this is just um, to give you an initial impression of uh, my contention at the start, that you can do a lot of interesting physics. So uh, Landau Fermi liquids in two dimensions, that is intrinsically interesting. Uh, superfluidity in a strict monolayer of helium-3, that would be even more interesting, but so far it's been unachieved. The nature of the superfluid transition in a fermionic monolayer is something that really hasn't been worked on, even theoretically, that much to my, to my knowledge. <coughs> Uh, we see uh, the mott hubbard transition um, with uh, a mass divergence. If I get time, I'll show that to you later. Uh, the Mott insulator that forms, we have evidence that it's a quantum spin liquid. <coughs> there are other classes of uh, two-dimensional solid that you can uh, get where rather than being uh, anti-ferromagnetic with a quantum spin liquid ground state, you're going to have a ferromagnetic solid. And so you can produce an ideal 2D ferromagnet and test the uh, Mermin-Wagner theorem that uh, our friends from, uh, is it New Zealand or Australia, was asking about that earlier. So an experimental test of, uh, of that. Uh, you can look at quantum criticality in helium-3 bilayers. Um, you can do costlet cell, the superfluid transition of helium-4 monolayer in an atomically layered film. Uh, John Reppy with Paul Crowell, his student, uh, did a bunch of work on a related system to that. And most recently, and um, perhaps uh, quite excitingly, that's a word, uh, we believe, uh, and this is published in this recent article, we have evidence for a new con quantum state with intertwined superfluid density wave order, which you might want to call a supersolid. But uh, it's very different from the classes of supersolid that the helium community have been obsessed with <coughs> recently. Um, so uh, this isn't quite uh, Shostakovich's Sixth Symphony uh, play backwards. Um, I've been thinking about that all week. Uh, actually, this talk is more like the 24 Preludes and Fugues. I don't know if you know that, because there's lots of little bits that are 
linked together. <laughs> um, so I'm going to start with uh, top down. <clears throat> and the material that we're interested in, the base material is superfluid helium-3, which as I said right at the outset is a model for topological superconductivity. <clears throat> And uh, this is the bulk phase diagram in the pressure temperature plane, and there are two phases, the A and B phase. <coughs> uh, it's P wave, so the pairs have one unit of orbital angular momentum and total spin one. <coughs> so there are three components of the orbital and spin triplet. In the B phase, you get all three. <coughs> it's essentially a J equals zero state, as you can probably read off from this. Uh, so the gap's isotropic. Uh, it, it preserves time reversal symmetry. <coughs> and through the general principle of bulk edge correspondence, then there are surface excitations. <coughs> and those surface excitations are Majorana fermions. And one of the properties of these Majorana fermions is that they are helical, namely that the spin is locked to the uh, perpendicular, actually, to the uh, momentum. So if we could detect uh, Majorana fermions and uh, show, uh, let's say, some non-local response of this gas of Majorana-like par particles, that would be something of a, of a breakthrough. <coughs> the other phase is uh, the A phase. Um, you just get two components of the spin triplet. Um, both up up pairs and down down pairs have the same direction of the orbital angular momentum. So all pairs have got the same orientation of the orbital angular momentum, L. So this is a chiral phrase. It breaks time reversal symmetry. <coughs> and it's only stabilized in bulk at high pressures. <coughs> uh, and that's got to do with so called strong coupling effects, um, spin fluctuation mediated pairing. Uh, and the pairing uh, is then influenced by the formation of the superfluid itself. That's what spin flux, that's what strong coupling means. <coughs> and now in this chiral phase, um, under the right conditions, we don't have any surface excitations, but we have edge excitations, and they are Majorana vial fermions. So there are analogs there with the uh, quantum Hall effect. Um, so our approach then uh, was uh, to look at superfluid helium-3 under uh, nanoscale uh, confinement. So our new tuning parameter is confinement. And what does that mean? Uh, so here we make uh, a cavity in silicon um, and we slap a piece of atomically flat glass on top and anodically bond the glass to the silicon, and we fill this cavity with superfluid helium-3. <coughs> and the height of the cavity, I'm going to call that D. <coughs> what does that need to be? It needs to be on the order of the superfluid coherence length. Think of that as the size of the Cooper pair. Think of a P-wave Cooper pair as kind of a diatomic molecule. There it is. And that's the diameter of the, of the pair. And because these parameters here uh, depend on pressure, and because we can tune also the pressure of this liquid, uh, then that coherence length is tunable from about 80 nanometers at zero pressure to about 20 nanometers at uh, the, melting, uh, the melting curve. So that means for a cavity of fixed height, uh, the confinement, the effective confinement is the ratio of the cavity height to this coherence length. And so we can tune that effective confinement then by varying the pressure. <coughs> and uh, the limit that we're currently working in then is that the cavity height is very much greater than the inverse Fermi wavelength. <coughs> As we shrink the cavity height uh, towards this value, 
then size quantization effect effects in the normal Fermi liquid because of motion in the, in, in the cavity are going to become the, the particle in the box energy level. It's going to become more of an issue. And we're going to turn the normal state into a quasi uh, two-dimensional state, a set of quasi two-dimensional states, which is going to potentially have interesting consequences. Um, so we're making the normal state more uh, two-dimensional. Um, so uh, most of the audience are theorists, but uh, I guess. Uh, but I'll just show you some pictures of, of cavities that we've used with different thicknesses and using um, different, uh, different techniques. And we can well characterize the height of the cavity. Um, uh, for the sort of cavity that I showed you here, which is unsupported, we use optical techniques um, to measure the height of the cavity as a function of position, and it's pretty uniform. And for thinner cavities where we're bonding silicon to silicon, the cavity, you can see these dotty things here. Those are posts, uh, pillars, if you like, to determine the um, height of the cavity. Um, so the other thing that was uh, important in the um, early days of bulk cyberhelium-3 to uh, determine the order parameter and to uh, validate this proposal that what was being seen was the A and B phase was NMR. The theory of this done, was done by Leggett. Um, and uh, this is where um, helium-3 superfluid is very different from superconductors. So what's happening in this case is that helium-3 atoms or quasi-particles are pairing. They each have, uh, each of the quasi-particles has spin one half. You do NMR then on the, uh, on the um, spin state of the fermions that are being paired. Um, so the nuclear spins are degrees of freedom of the Cooper pairs, and you're manipulating those. So you get very direct access through NMR to the superfluid order, order parameter. And what you're measuring is frequency shifts, and the frequency shifts scale as the mean square gap. Um, and this can be used then, uh, th this relationship, the details of it depend on what the superfluid phase is. So you can use the NMR frequency shift to fingerprint the order parameter. <coughs> Whereas in unconventional superconductors, uh, it's very, very hard to determine what the order parameter is. There are many theoretical ideas, but proving them is tough. Uh, it's straightforward in superfluid helium-3. <coughs> So the first confinement that we had was 0.7 uh, microns, so that's about 10 times the coherence length. And that already has a profound effect on the phase diagram. So this is the bulk phase diagram, and this is the phase diagram that we see in the cavity. And what you see is whereas the A phase only exists at high pressures in bulk, it's stabilized uh, at uh, low pressures in the cavity. <coughs> so why is that? And in a nutshell, it's got to do with surface scattering. So unconventional superconductors, the signature of those is that they are extremely sensitive uh, to magnetic impurities. So the sensitivity of the TC of uranium platinum-3 and strontium ruthenate to uh, non-magnetic impurities <coughs> was a key piece of evidence that these systems exhibited unconventional pairing. <coughs> in superfluid helium-3, the beauty is we have no impurities. But what we have is surfaces. We have the sur top surface and the bottom surface of this cavity. <coughs> Quasiparticles will scatter from um, those surfaces. And in principle, there are different ways that that scattering can occur. So you could have uh, a surface that's scattered all quasi-particles specularly, or the other limit where a quasi-particle comes in and it's scattered randomly. This is called a specular surface. This is called a diffuse surface. And there's another class of surface with which Sauls came up with um, based on his obsession with cycling. 
um, uh, which is a retro-reflecting surface, which is, uh, uh, I'm going to say, maximally pair-breaking, where a quasi-particle comes in and then is scattered back in the opposite, uh, opposite direction. And what this surface scattering does then is uh, the following, uh, that the different components of the order parameter are suppressed in somewhat different ways as you uh, approach a, a, a wall. And those components where the, uh, of the order parameter where uh, the, the projection of their orbital angular momentum um, is uh, it, it's parallel to the wall, uh, so L sub Z is, 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 is zero, where Z is the normal to the wall, uh, those are uh, uh, maximally uh, suppressed. <coughs> Whereas if the angular momentum is normal to the wall, then for specular surfaces, there is no suppression. Uh, for, for diffuse scattering, all components of the order parameter are suppressed. <coughs> And because of the different pairing states of B phase and A phase, this means then that um, uh, the A phase is, because of this pair breaking effect, the A phase is favored. That's what leads to um, this um, stability of the A phase at, at these low pressures, where the confinement is greatest, effective confinement is greatest. Now, um, the scattering mechanisms are also important because when we come on to discuss these emergent surface states, uh, whether the surface is specular or diffuse scattering controls the spectrum of these surface excitations. So having established uh, that then, uh, we want to uh, have stronger confinement uh, to look for new phases uh, to, to approach the quasi two-dimensional limit. Uh, so we need to make thinner cavities. And so this is a picture of a 200 nanometer uh, sil silicon cell. <coughs> and this is finite element modeling calculation of what that does when you apply pressure. So it kind of inflates like a balloon. Um, so at zero pressure, you start off with 200 nanometers, and the balloon then expand effect expands the cavity by about two nanometers per bar. Um, so we pretty well know what the height of this cavity is. And what is important for us to do is to characterize uh, this the suppression of the superfluid TC, which arises from the surface suppression of the order parameter that we just dis just discussed by uh, surface scattering. Uh, so we can measure the TC by NMR of the liquid inside the cavity, and then we have some small regions of bulk liquid here and here um, as a reference point. And this is what the data, the, the data is then. Uh, so for diffuse surfaces here, you see uh, the left-hand signal is a slab, and there's, this is temperature, this is frequency, so there's, there's the onset of a frequency shift, so that's the superfluid transition in the slab. This is the transition in the bulk, which is occurring at a higher temperature. And now, when we make the surfaces specular, um, the two transitions occur at the same temperature. So making the surface specular uh, eliminates uh, uh, TC suppression. Why does it eliminate TC suppression? Uh, because um, for, uh, look at these order parameters. For the A phase, um, all the pairs have got the same direction of orbital angular momentum. So you can orient that angular momentum perpendicular to the wall. So then you only have L sub Z plus or minus one. So the only component that's relevant of, the, of any order parameter that's relevant for the A phase is this green guy. And for specular surfaces, it's not suppressed as you approach the wall. Therefore, for specular surfaces, uh, you will get no TC suppression. Um, and how do you make specular surfaces? Well, you coat the surface with a superfluid helium-4 film, and that seems to work. So let's demonstrate that here then. So this is uh, 
uh, Tc uh, of the slab divided by Tc of bulk as a function of effective uh, confinement. So what we're doing then is uh, th this is a material parameter and we're tuning uh, the pressure um, uh, and uh, hence we're tuning the, the coherence length, whereas D is more, more or less fixed. Um, so here you see uh, no TC suppression and uh, uh, hence specularity. We can put an upper limit on to how far we are from purely specular. For diffuse boundary conditions, uh, the result agrees very well with quasi-classical theory. And when we have pure helium-3 on the wall, uh, then we have evidence for magnetic scattering. But I don't have time to go into that now. And in the A phase, we can also measure the, uh, the order parameter. Um, so this is low pressure, this is high pressure. And this shows you then that uh, low pressures where the coherence length is largest and hence the effective confinement is greatest, you see maximal suppression of the gap for, this is now for diffuse surface scattering and specular surface scattering. And the dashed line here is what you would expect for an unsuppressed uh, gap. So this is the first test of what would have been expected in these systems. And the key thing is that we are able to um, establish specular scattering uh, surfaces. The transition into the A phase, uh, by the way, uh, is discussed in terms of a topological phase transition, where now the defects are domain walls between the L vector pointing up and the L vector pointing down. So there are predictions of splitting of the transition into the A phase by these gentlemen, which is a future goal to observe. <coughs> so approaching uh, the uh, quasi uh, 2D limit, then we want to shrink the cavity height. Uh, the system becomes more quasi two dimensional because of the size quantization effect. We need to have specular surfaces in order to do that. Otherwise with diffuse surfaces, um, the um, superfluidity will be completely suppressed by the, by, by, by the scattering. And then there's some interesting issues around is there any uh, residual, or how do you understand potential residual disorder in that system? And I just want to make this point uh, because I think it's quite, quite pretty. Uh, that the effective disorder potential seen by, uh, uh, by a film can be related to uh, the uh, surface roughness. So if the surface is rough, the thickness of the cavity varies as a function of, uh, of, of position. And what these people showed then is if you map uh, something with a smooth surface and a rough surface onto something with two smooth surfaces, uh, then uh, because the system is no longer translationally invariant, that means that momentum is not a good quantum number, and so you can recover that by introducing a disorder potential. So the bottom line is, is that the disorder potential is determined by the surface roughness. And since the surface roughness can be measured by atomic force microscopy, then you have a a system with fully determined disorder potential, which is, I think, quite unu unusual. So what is the future? So let's uh, call the future topological mesoscopic superfluidity. We're taking a topological superfluid, and uh, we're looking at it on a mesoscopic length scale. <coughs> and what we want to do is look at hybrid structures which I'll explain. So in hybrid structures, uh, confinement now is the control parameter which determines the material from which this mesoscopic device is, is made. These materials are going to be different P wave superfluid phases. <coughs> what we're doing is we're doing, using the geometry of the cavity to do sculpture on the superfluid to create new superfluid states just by the confinement. <coughs> and the idea is that that will be helpful uh, in order for us to gain access 
to surface and interface excitations, which I guess are the primary focus of the topological quantum matter community. <coughs> so what do I mean by a hybrid nanostructure? <coughs> so one of the pioneers of hybrid metallic nanostructures is Viktor Petrushov, who came from Chernogolovka to our department um, 20 years ago. And this is about making structures which involve different metals and junctions between different metals. <coughs> and the physics then is the Andreev reflection, let's say, that happens between an S-wave superconductor and a normal metal at such a, a junction between silver and aluminium, let, uh, let, let, let's say. So the idea is uh, we've already talked about one interface, which is the interface between the topological superfluid and the surface of the cavity. Now let's talk about an interface that you could create within the liquid itself. So it's a bit like uh, the story of um, uh, doped semiconductors and uh, the creation of very clean PN junctions in a semiconductor because you're just taking a single crystal, let's say silicon, and doping it differently in different regions of the crystal. <coughs> And that's why transistors work, because the interface is incredibly clean. <coughs> so here, um, confinement is the control parameter. So if we have a, a region here of extremely strong confinement, we can suppress the superfluidity. And so yellow here is normal. And here we have less confinement, and so we have a superfluid. So we've created an SNS junction. And at the SN junction, we'll live um, if this is B phase, uh, Majorana fermions. And then we can look at transport across this junction and ask the question, will that transport be, be influenced by those exotic excitations living at these interfaces? Moreover, <coughs> we have flexibility uh, on the, uh, on the uh, length of this junction. We, we could even make uh, an NSN junction, which I think will be unusual in solid state physics. <coughs> and the other important quantity is the inelastic uh, scattering length, which at one millikelvin in helium-3 is about 50 microns. So it's huge in comparison with the coherence length. Um, so I think it's an, a nice playground. Um, the, the other thing about structured confinement, talking about order parameter sculpture then, uh, you can imagine introducing a post into the superfluid. This is a unit cell. Uh, th that clearly uh, breaks uh, in-plane rotational symmetry. And as a result, new kinds of P-wave order parameter phases appear. Uh, rather than posts, you could have channels and this is a prediction of, uh, of Wyman and Sauls, that, uh, again, new phases appear, including a periodic uh, domain wall structure of the chiral phase uh, and the uh, polar phase, and so on. Uh, yeah. The third example is you could create a periodic array of channels and islands. Uh, this is beginning to look a bit like uh, a Kitaev uh, chain. This would be the inverse structure. So here I'm imagining that the light areas are where the superfluid helium-3 uh, resides. So the possibilities are multiple. <coughs> uh, you can also have, uh, rather than engineering new phases, there is the idea that new superfluid states will arise spontaneously under confinement. Um, this is the stripe phase predicted by Vorontsov and Sauls where you have a spatially modulated order parameter. So this is one version of the B phase. This is another version of the B phase that's uh, r related to this version by this rotation and phase change. <coughs> and between those two phases, you necessarily have uh, a, a domain wall. And the point about, uh, and I won't go into details, but the point about confinement in the cavity is that these domain walls are predicted to arise uh, spontaneously. So you, the idea is between the A phase and the B phase, you would spontaneously form a stripe phase. <coughs> and that's the analog of the FFLO phase in a superconductor, which is long so sought after. And um, 
uh, whether it's been observed or not, is a matter of controversy still. And we've done NMR experiments to search for this uh, stripe phase. Um, I haven't got time to go into details. Um, it could be that the spatial modulation is not in the form of stripes, but what Levitin, our postdoc, prefers to call a polka dot phase. So this is plus minus, plus minus, but with a different uh, mor morphology, but it's still uh, spatially uh, modulated. And NMR, again, I can't go into detail, but NMR provides the fingerprint of uh, plus, or, plus or minus because it does some averaging of components of the gap. And uh, in such a spatially modulated phase, one of these averages is, uh, is equal to zero. So I said that the frequency shifts are related to the size of the gap. Um, so uh, averaged over the cavity, so if there is an average which is zero, it shows up in the NMR frequency shift. Um, so uh, the AB transition is an interesting transition, first order transition that Leggett has done a lot of work on. Um, the idea is that conventional nucleation theory, um, you, you should never be able to nucleate the B phase from the uh, A phase. The lifetime, the metastable lifetime of the supercalled A phase should be many times greater than the age of the, of, uh, of the universe. Nevertheless, in bulk superfluid helium-3, uh, the B phase is observed. Uh, and the idea behind that uh, Leggett's proposal was that it's uh, a mechanism that relies on uh, cosmic rays doing something interesting as they pass through the fluid and locally heat it. <coughs> Our volumes are extremely small, um, and we find absolutely tiny um, supercooling effects. <coughs> so here the idea is that uh, under confinement, there is an intrinsic nucleation mechanism. And an interesting candidate for this intrinsic nucleation mechanism is that there's a model by Henry Tai and Wones called uh, resonant, re resonant tunneling, where uh, if you have, uh, here is the, 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 the local um, A phase vacuum, it would like to get into the B phase, but it can't do that, so the A phase is metastable. But if you introduce uh, a further local minimum between these two, uh, then there are conditions under which that, that uh, third minimum can in significantly enhance how the system tunnels from the A phase to the B phase. <coughs> and this stripe phase, which occurs at the border of the A phase and the B phase that I just mentioned, could uh, provide then uh, a, a, a set of intermediate states such that the A to B nucleation occurs via this resonant tunneling hypothesis. And uh, people are always looking for cosmological analogues of superfluid helium-3, and this m might be a model for phase transitions, first order phase transitions in the early universe. Um, so uh, about the surface excitations then, um, this is now the, 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 the B phase. This is the surface density of states uh, as a function of energy. Uh, and look at the red curve for which uh, you have a perfectly specular surface. Uh, and then you have such a density of states which arises from a linearly uh, dispersing uh, Majorana, Majorana cone. So with specular walls, we have um, um, uh, Majoranas, which are dispersing uh, with uh, a linear relation between energy and, and momentum. They are helical, and we would like to find ways of detecting that. And in the chiral A phase, uh, with, specular, with specular surfaces, there are no surface states on the upper and lower surfaces of the cavity, but there are these edge, edge modes. Um, so uh, what are our, what are we working on then? Uh, we want to detect those Majoranas. Uh, the beauty of superfluid helium-3 is that there are Anderson Higg mo Higgs modes, that is to say, collective modes of the um, order parameter, um, up to quadrupolar type distortions of the gap. <coughs> uh, the characteristic frequencies are on the order of the gap frequency, obviously less than two delta. 
Um, and they couple uh, to zero sound, collisionless sound, which Landau uh, first predicted. Uh, it's probably an experimental validation, if you like, of Landau Fermi liquid theory, was the existence of zero sound. So even when omega tau, the frequency of the sound times the relaxation time, is very much greater than one, so you're way outside the hydrodynamic limit, sound will still propagate via a distortion of the Fermi surface. And that distortion of the Fermi surface couples to these order parameters of collective modes. <coughs> and so it's an, a, a question that is interesting, people, which is how do those collective modes then couple to the, uh, to, to, to the surface states? <coughs> Other ways of detecting the modes is they will make uh, thermodynamic contributions. So for example, they modify the superfluid density. Uh, they're helical, so we could use a magnetic technique um, to access that. And they will exhibit non-locality. So if we have local probes and correlations in observa observations from local probes, then we could try to seek non-locality. And in the chiral A phase, then, with the edge modes, um, the objectives are to look at mass, thermal transport, and the magnetic uh, Hall effect. <coughs> So the point about these systems in, is that I've tried to convince you in this part is to, uh, that we're able to engineer surfaces. Importantly, we're able to interface interfaces between different superfluid phases or between the superfluid phase and the normal state. Um, so these are classes of what I'll call helium-3 uh, materials. <coughs> we can always use NMR to establish the nature of the condensate <coughs> and uh, we're doing all of this in the absence of disorder within the uh, liquid itself. <coughs> How am I doing for time? Uh, two, minutes. two minutes. Okay. Um, so um, uh, many things can happen. We're now going to the bottom up. So this is two minutes on bottom up. Uh, so we have a fluid. We can tune its density. <coughs> Uh, there's some mod insulating phase here. As we approach the mod insulating phase, we see a, diversion, uh, a divergence of the, uh, of the effective mass, which you can pick up uh, through measurements of the heat capacity and also through the, uh, through the magnetization. Um, the, uh, in, it, 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 you can look at this effect on uh, helium-3 on hydrogen or helium-3 on helium-4, and they seem to behave somewhat differently. In the case of helium-3 on helium-4, you have a, a broad uh, coexistence region in which the conversion from fluid to solid appears to happen over a range of coverages, but uh, the solid fraction grows in an interesting non-linear way uh, so this means that this transition cannot, absolutely cannot be thought of as a liquid-solid transition by uh, um, going through a liquid-solid coexistence region. Uh, this is a quantum coexistence. Uh, and as you go through this coexistence region, what you see uh, in the, f uh, there's the solid component and there is the fluid component. Um, the material parameters are changing as well as the relative proportions of these two phases. Um, and the effective mass of the fluid component is, di is, is diverging. So this looks like a Wigner mott transition rather than a strict mott, mott, mott transition. This, uh, uh, now we're in the mott insulating phase, then um, it, it appears to be a, a, a quantum spin liquid. I need to show this slide to bring in Thaulis. Um, so uh, the solid in question is a two-dimensional solid on a triangular lattice. Um, so it's frustrated uh, geometrically. But there's another source of frustration, which is ring exchange, first introduced by Thaulis. So the magnetic Hamiltonian depends on permutation operators. And uh, the, sim the, the, the initial simplest class of permutations is two-body permutation, three-particle ring exchange, and the exchange of four particles. And uh, two and three-particle exchange are um, both Heisenberg-like. Uh, two-particle exchange, because of this argument, is anti-ferromagnetic. Three-particle exchange is ferromagnetic. Uh, because three-particle exchange wins out in this highly compressed structure, 
then the overall Heisenberg term is, uh, is anti-ferromagnetic, is ferromagnetic, and that's frustrated by four particle exchange. Um, so when you're in a regime, which I can't go into details of uh, where the frustration is killed, then you see uh, two-dimensional ferromagnetism. Um, so this is the magnetization as a function of temperature, uh, and uh, the magnetization uh, can exist at finite temperature despite the Mermin-Wagner theorem because of the Zeeman gap and, um, and because of finite size effects. Um, and uh, now we go back into the modern insulator phase. We have a quantum spin. We have a quantum spin liquid. I just want to end because um, uh, I need to show this uh, this slide uh, because it relates to the uh, the BKT story that we heard earlier uh, earlier this week. That now, uh, so let's go to the same place where we've just been discussing this quantum spin liquid, and replace the helium three atoms with helium four. Um, and now the action is occurring in this layer of, of helium-4. And using the torsional oscillator technique that John Reppy mentioned earlier in the, in, in the week, then we find evidence of a superfluid response in that, in that solid phase. It has an anomalous temperature dependence. <coughs> and importantly, it has no finite temperature cost let's sell this transition, despite it being two-dimensional and, and superfluid. So we make an ansatz for the excitation spectrum and an ansatz for the quasi-condensate. And our claim then is that the quasi-condensate is, is a non-abelian condensate, which is an entangled state of both superfluid and density wave, density wave order. Um, so uh, this is the superfluid response. It's maximum here as we approach the completion of the layer. We can tune it away. We can scale all of the data, collapsing the data onto these two curves. This is the scaling form that we use. Our ansatz for the excitation spectrum uh, to get the leading order temperature dependence of the normal density is linear. Uh, in order to get that, uh, we are relying then on there being a very soft uh, roton minimum with a gap that's less than the lowest temperature at which we do measurements. Uh, this is the Landau prescription for calculating the normal density, which is a momentum-weighted average over the excitation spectrum. So these excitations dominate uh, the normal density, and this accounts for the leading order linearity in T. The Feynman-Cohen argument would then say uh, that this dispersion relation then uh, it, uh, is derived from the structure factor and would predict then that you have structure factor which peaks at these reciprocal lattice vectors of a solid structure. So the ansatz for the excitation spectrum is consistent with the existence of, uh, den of density wave order. And uh, this is the condensate, quasi-condensate wave function that we propose. And what's important then is this is an intertwined state of superfluid and density wave order. Uh, this is very different from the case where you have coexisting solid order and superfluid order, let's say in lattice gas models, where the superfluidity arises from the filling of the two-dimensional lattice gas. Um, this is something where the entire layer is, uh, is superfluid, and it's like a Cheshire cat of, uh, a, a, of entanglement between superfluidity and, um, and density wave order, or solidity, if, if you will. So the way that I visualize it, then, is by a, a block sphere such as this, where this is the quasi-condensate uh, in the, quasi the zero-momentum state. This is the quasi-condensate in the uh, finite-momentum state. These Gs are the reciprocal lattice vectors of the, uh, the uh, two-dimensional density, density wave order. Uh, the, uh, the, the modulation in density it goes as the sine of this angle. And now the idea is, is that um, because our, our, our solid is, is, is incommensurate, so that the energy is un invariant under translations, uh, then the state vector then can be anywhere on this block sphere. So this is just a, a case where you have just one single reciprocal lattice vector 
of course, in a honeycomb lattice or a triangular lattice, rather, you have six. So we're talking about a hypersphere in reality rather than just a, 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 a simple sphere. And because three-dimensional rotations don't commute, um, then uh, the system is non-abelian, vortices are no longer stable, and we see no uh, finite temperature across its surface transition. So we think this is a new kind of uh, intertwined superfluid and density wave order, order parameter. And that's in this recent paper, and I'm going to wind up by my final remarks. Apologies for going over. So our cold atoms are helium. We have fermions or bosons, and they can be manipulated to create, I think, new materials. So helium is the base, and it, it, it can be formed into new effective materials with uh, uh, many interesting classes of quantum ground states. Um, and we can measure these in, in thermal equilibrium. So it's a kind of a quantum simulator in many respects. Thank you. Uh, with your block sphere, how is it that you can visualize your chi or heat? Um, back, uh, yes. This chi because you are plotting the density matrix, right? And that disappear. Or am I some somewhat wrong? Well, this is, uh, I, I think, uh, the symmetry in this case is SG2. Yeah, but you, I, so you, are, I think you it's are appropriate effectively plotting chi, the bracket of psi, which is effectively remove your chi, e to the i chi, and yeah, e so to that's minus the, i chi. Yeah, so that's this phase factor here. Um, OK, maybe yeah. I'll discuss it. Uh, the other thing is that um, with the um, helium tree A phase, yeah. would you be able to observe vortices? Uh, sure, you uh, under rotation. Yes. I mean, so that you can take these systems and you can put them on rotating uh, cryostats. So one interesting uh, uh, object then is the half quantum vortex. Uh, the stability of which in the A phase is open to uh, some, some question. You could ask the question whether under confinement would the half quantum vortex be stable. Um, the Alto group in Finland has recently demonstrated that um, the half quantum vortex um, is stable in the, in, in, the polar, in, in the polar phase. But in order to achieve that, they have to fill bulk superfluid helium-3 with a disordered um, set of uh, silica uh, 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 st strands. <coughs> but you could try to uh, replicate those geometries uh, in engineered nano-confined structures also. But you're right. I mean, uh, to have controllable half quantum vortices in such a system and then to be able to man manipulate them would be an interesting long-term goal. Uh, we we'll, um, so our goal then will be to uh, try to engineer um, by the sculpture thing I was talking about uh, um, a scenario where both the polar phase and the A phase would be stable, and then to do quenching from the A phase uh, between the A phase and the polar phase. Uh, and the idea is that is that the half quantum vortices will be metastable within the uh, Within the chiral, within the chiral phase, uh, the other option is that, that the uh, the alto group may pick up on our techniques and use this confinement and put it on a cryostat that is physically rotating. I mean, they've been working on rotating helium three since about I don't know 1990 and have done a lot of beautiful work in that area. So, here, hello, yes. So I have a related question. I mean, since you mentioned, you know, you didn't mention vortices, but you mentioned testing known locality. So I would like to get from you how is that you could measure known locality that I imagine that you refer to non-abelian braiding or something like that. No, the, what I was thinking of there was um, 
uh, the B phase. So on the, the on the surface of the B phase, we have yeah. dispersely Majorana excitations. Right. Um, so we would, uh, let's say, magnetically uh, perturb um, the system in um, locally on some region of the surface and look for a response uh, at, at some other region, region of the surface. <coughs> And that the characteristic, the, the speed of light, if you like, uh, in the system is relatively low. Um, so the uh, dispersion cone, um, the, the, the slope of that is essentially a fraction of the Landau critical velocity. So that's on the order of less than a centimeter per second in, in the system. So the fact that the speed of light is relatively low you would hope then would enable us, it makes conditions more favorable for looking for non-instantaneous and non-local response, rather than causally driven through some propagation mechanism through the surface excitations. That's the rough idea. Yeah, you don't believe me, do you? No, but this is not exactly the property that you would like to test of these things. This is like um, the different thing. Th well, yeah. Well, then um, th that's th th that's good because uh, th I'm a humble experimentalist. So theoretical <laughs> advice on the best ways of testing for non-locality are, are point. something that I'm interested in. Uh, excuse me. Would these non-abelian condensates have any relevance in quark gluon plasmas? No idea. Uh, Sorry, I'm my my I'm not Renaissance man enough to answer <laughs> that question. <laughs> My apologies. I'm not being flippant. I, it's just but true. I'm not sure that. Well, yeah. I, yeah. Um, I, I don't think you get, because uh, we were interested in flashback resonances in two-dimensional helium-3, and I don't think you get flashback resonances in, in, two, in, in two dimensions, because, this, because uh, well, certainly in fermionic systems, the sc scattering length is always, doesn't change sign, it's always positive, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Is it? Oh, amazingly, yeah. <laughs> 